I'm so grateful to be here this morning. It has been a surreal couple weeks as we've been been kind of accelerating towards the close of Gospel of Mark sermon series. And, and the sermon series has been, well, we're on week 56 now. So we started on June 26th of 2021, and it has just been impactful for our church to work verse by verse through this book. So if you're new, you're getting here at the perfect time, right at the end of the movie. So you'll catch the very last five minutes, but it's the best part because we're going to look at Jesus on the cross and then the resurrection next Sunday. So I'm really excited for that. And I do want to say, if you are new, thanks for being here. I know that it can be or be a bit nerve wracking going to a new place. I just want to honor you and thank you for being here. I pray that the Lord meets with you. That's our prayer every single week is that you encounter the love of God. That's what we're praying for. So over the last several weeks, we have been working through the passion narrative. So if you've seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ, it's, it's called The Passion Narrative. It's the story of Jesus' final hours of his life. Okay, so we looked at how he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that, that God would, would maybe find another way for him to redeem the world, but then he submitted himself to the Father. And then we saw him betrayed and arrested and put on two different trials. And then he was beaten and bruised and 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 uh, went to the cross, and actually last week we saw him get put up on the cross, and, and throughout all of this, he hasn't retaliated, he hasn't tried to save his own skin, he hasn't shrinked back, he has submitted himself fully to the Father's will, and now this week we're going to finish the cross, or the cross narrative, we're going to see Jesus die, and I'll be honest with you, preparing for this text this week was really weighty, it's a glorious, beautiful, gut-wrenching, and mysterious text all at once, and and honestly, it can be hard to grasp quite everything that's happening here because there's so much loaded into this passage. So I, I've just been praying, Lord, can you help me to do this text justice this morning? So that's what I'm praying for. But let's look at it. It's Mark 15, verse 33 uh, through 39. It says, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani. Uh, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge filled with sour wine and, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. All right, the title is Forsaken, Forsaken. Let's pray over it and we'll dive on in. So Lord, uh, we thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for everything you've done through this series over these last couple of years. And God, we're uh, just expecting as we close this out here in the next few weeks, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. I pray that this would not just be like my own ideas. It wouldn't just be like human wisdom, but it would be a demonstration of your spirit's power. And I, I pray that this, this text, this, this glorious, mysterious text would, would just be pressed into our hearts and we would see the truth of it. So Lord, I pray that you would do your thing and have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, so Emily and I, we got married in 2013. We were 20 years old and we're celebrating 10 years of marriage in June. We're excited for that. So woohoo, it's been an amazing journey. Yeah, you can kind of clap if you want. I don't know, but I'll clap for myself. Yay, okay, so <laughs> I'm kidding. I just always hard when you're trying to figure out, are we clapping right now or not? Okay, okay, but uh, so, so anyways, we have three children. Jane, who's four, Abram, who's two, he'll be three in June, and then Caleb, who is one, he'll be turning two on the 18th of April. He was born is that right? Sorry, I thought I messed it up for a second. All right, the 18th of April, the day after Easter, he was born last year. Um, and we actually found out a few months, well, probably a month or two ago, that we're having a fourth baby in September. So praise God for that. I just want to let you know about that. So, because Emily is showing now, we can't, you know, we have to tell you at this point. So fourth baby, weren't trying, but it happened. So we're excited. It's going to be good. And we already have, so four kids, five and under is what we're going to have. So if you want to come live at our house for free and help us take care of our kids, let's do it. All right. So it's been quite the ride these last 10 years. Uh, we helped kind of re-pioneer Chi Alpha Campus Ministry at UNI. We did that for five years. We planted this church in 2020. We've had three going on four kids. It has been quite the 10 years. And if you didn't know, our marriage journey actually started in Minneapolis. So we got married, and then we moved up to Minneapolis so I could go to Bible college. I felt the call to ministry, and we, we transferred schools up there so I could do that. And we had no money at all. We were broke, and, and we had to pick the cheapest apartment possible. We weren't like, like, we had no, like, requirements for what it needed to have. We are just like, 
cheap as possible, as close as possible to my school. And, and we found an apartment in downtown Minneapolis. You can see it there. So, yeah. You know, good thing we were mature when we got married. But uh, <laughs> sorry, just making fun of myself. But, but yeah, so anyways, I, I want to show you a few pictures of it. So we found this 450 square feet apartment. So you walk in uh, to the entryway. There's our office. And there's a bathroom. Taking a picture with an iPad because I didn't have an iPhone. Because again, we were broke. But uh, so, so, okay, there's the, yeah, there's the office entryway, there's the bathroom out to the right, you go around the corner, and then there's the kitchen right there. If you look this way, the kitchen, you look that way, there's the living room. Um, and then off to the, let's go, and then there's another side of the kitchen, and then off to the left, there's a bedroom. Uh, and that was all it was, 450 square feet. And we loved it, though, because it was ours, and we could be together. We were so excited about the potential of living together in downtown Minneapolis. We had all these dreams about it, you know, romantic feelings about it. But on the very first night, our dreams were dashed. We were sitting on the ground in the dark in the living room talking. And as we're talking, Emily's sitting like this. I don't know if you're all be able to see me. She's sitting like this with her hand on the ground and there's something that kind of crawls by her. It's dark. <laughs> it's like big and black. And I don't like anything that's small or crawls besides baby or human babies. But uh, so obviously I love babies. But uh, so it crawls by her and I'm like, don't move. Don't move. I didn't know what to do, though. Our, our blissful home was being invaded. <laughs> our experience that first night in Minneapolis is similar to what happened to the first human beings in the Garden of Eden. So, so God creates the world. It's perfect. He, he sets apart the, or the first couple to live in this paradise and to enjoy communion with him and with, one, and with one another. It says this in Genesis 2. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they're one flesh. They're fused together at the deepest levels. They're enjoying life. It's, it says in verse 25, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They're naked. They're proud of it. It's going good. And they're living freely before God and one another. They were living their best life, right? It was amazing. And they were excited about the future together. God had given them a commission to go and, and, to, and to rule over the world. They were excited. They were excited about the future, just like Emily and I were in Minneapolis. But then Genesis 3 happens. It says this in verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Okay, so they're chilling in the Garden of Eden. They're talking. And then the serpent comes you know, slithering by, who we now know to be the devil. He comes into their perfect home. And God had told Adam and Eve previously that they couldn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They could do anything else, but they can't eat of that tree. And of course, the serpent tries to get them to do that. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Okay, so this nasty alien invader was trying to get them to question what God had already told them. He tried to get them to doubt God's good and perfect instructions. And he ended up getting Eve to eat of the tree, and then Adam followed and with that fateful decision, death, sin, and evil infested our world. Paul says it this way later in the New Testament in Romans 5. He says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. So they chose, and we have continued to choose to invite or to let death and evil into the world through our sin. And now, because of this, we're given over to spiritual blindness. We can't see God. We can't see what he's doing. We're given over to sickness and violence and addiction, tornadoes, anybody, and pure evil like we saw last week in Tennessee. Okay, so sin, death, and evil have infected our world. And the question is, what's the solution? Like, what's the solution to this? And God, he actually gives us a hint right away in Genesis chapter 3. He, he gives us a glimpse. He, he says this to the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Okay, so an offspring, a woman, will crush the head of the serpent. A human being will somehow defeat the evil one who is bent on getting people to rebel against God and and who is trying to destroy God's good and perfect world. A human being will, will crush his head. And this is how the story of the scriptures begin. God creates, again, a good and perfect world, and, and the devil entices humans to rebel against their maker. But God promises that in the end, a human being will crush the devil's head. And then later on in Genesis, we see that, that God forms a people. He calls a man named Abraham to follow him. And this people becomes the, or the people of Israel 
And they're calling us to love God with their whole hearts, to obey him and to be a light to the world. And the hope is that the world will see Israel's relationship with God and they will be compelled to worship God as well. They'll want in on it. They'll say, I want some of that. However, if you read the Old Testament, Israel, they fail miserably at this task. They run from God, they complain, they disobey him, and they fail to be a light. In the Old Testament, it closes with the people of Israel, God's chosen people, God's special people, they are being dominated by foreign powers. But in the midst of that, so they're being oppressed, they're they're dominated. In the midst of that, they're holding out hope that God will send a king who they call the Messiah, who will come and rescue them from oppression and help them fulfill their calling to love God and to be a light. They're holding out hope for that. This king, again, is, is referred to as the Messiah, and he will fulfill the ancient prophecy of Genesis 3. He will bruise the devil and make things right. At the beginning of Mark's gospel, we see that Mark believes that he has found that king. It says this in Mark 1.1. This is the very first week of our series. He says, It says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus the Messiah, right? Because Christ means Messiah. It's not his last name. Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Okay, so Mark seems to have found the one who will crush that serpent's head. During Jesus' first sermon in Mark, his very first sermon, a man who was possessed by a servant of that ancient serpent confronts Jesus. It says this, and immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And then Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. Okay, so all these years later, the serpent is still wreaking havoc. One of his demons senses that there is something special about Jesus. Maybe he's the one who will bruise his master's head. That's what the demon's worried about. And Jesus proceeds to crush the demon's influence in this particular man's life. And we see him do this multiple times in the Gospel of Mark. He repeatedly pushes back darkness. He pushes back the devil's rule. But he doesn't defeat him once and for all yet. But he's going to. He's going to defeat the devil. In chapter 3, Jesus told the religious leaders that he would bind Satan up and plunder his house. That's what Jesus said he was going to do to Satan. But the question remains, how will he do this? How is he going to plunder the devil's house? How will he crush his head once and for all? At this point in our story, in Mark chapter 15, things aren't looking very good, right? This Messiah, this king, he's hanging on a tree. He's dying on a cross. He's, He's bleeding. He's being mocked by And not only by the Jewish people, but by the Romans, right? The ones who were oppressing Israel. He's being mocked by them. It appears that darkness has crushed his head. It says this in Mark 15, 33. It says, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Okay, the sixth to the ninth hour would have been noon to 3 p.m. Okay, so as the sun is at its highest point, darkness is covering the land. And it recalls God's judgment on on Egypt in the story of Exodus when God makes uh, the entire land pitch black that's one of his plagues they couldn't even see one another it was so dark just as in exodus there's a there's no natural explanation for the darkness here at golgotha it's a supernatural darkness there's a cosmic confrontation happening here okay so jesus he faced supernatural darkness but the question is what's the nature of this darkness is it just a physical darkness over the land well In verse 34, it says this, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay, so his cry, it gives us a glimpse of what the darkness is symbolizing. As darkness swallows the land, Jesus is being forsaken by God. He's being separated from him. Okay, the darkness was separation from God. Okay, back in the Garden of Gethsemane, we saw that Jesus was terrified of the cross he was terrified not because of physical punishment but because of the separation that he was going to experience from his heavenly father it was so terrifying that in luke's gospel he tells us that he would sweat drops of blood as he prayed okay so now he's finally facing this separation head on the darkness of judgment and separation from god that sin ushered into the world way back in genesis 3 is beginning to settle over jesus He was facing what Adam and Eve faced when they were kicked out of the garden, but to a far greater degree. Unlike Adam and Eve, he never sinned once. He didn't deserve this. He was 
And unlike Adam and Eve, he was facing judgment for the sin of the entire cosmos, of the entire world. It was being poured out on him, that judgment. All of the sin of the world and all of the judgment against sin was being poured out on God himself. He was bearing everything that's gone wrong in the world and its consequences. Isaiah, way back 700 years before this, had prophesied that this would happen in in chapter 53 of his book. He said, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Okay, so the key is the end there, the iniquity of us all. The full weight of sin and death was being poured out onto God by God. He's bearing it himself. Like like, like this is a big deal. Jesus, he had experienced perfect community in relationship with his Father and with the Holy Spirit for all of eternity. And theologians have called this relationship the dance of God. It's it's like for all of eternity, they've been dancing together. Father, Son, and Spirit have experienced profound intimacy with one another. And they've loved and served each other perfectly and completely. They've been in, in divine communion with one another. But because of our sin and out of love for us, that relationship was being fragmented here. And this is not simply a fragmentation of a normal relationship. It's cutting through the eternal Godhead. This was the cause of unbearable torment for Jesus. Imagine if I preach a sermon here on a Sunday, and one of you comes up to me afterwards and says, that sermon stinks, I'm never coming back. I'll be bummed for a few days. I'm like, that hurt my feelings, that's not nice. <laughs> but I'll get over it, okay? Like, we'll move on. But now, if my wife came to me tonight and said, I hate you and I never want to see you again, that would probably be a greater sting, wouldn't it? Okay, the greater and stronger the relationship, the greater uh, the pain and the loss of that relationship, right? Okay, so Tim Keller, he says this in his book on Mark. He says, the longer the love, the deeper the love, the greater the torment of its loss. This love was infinitely long, absolutely perfect, and Jesus was losing it. Jesus was being cut off from the dance. Okay, for this moment and for the days following, Jesus was being cut off from the dance of God. He was being forsaken by his very own father. And separation from his father was utter darkness. What was happening in the land is what was happening spiritually. And this is what happens when we're separated from God. God is the source of everything good. He's the source of breath in our lungs, as John talked about. And separation from him is utter darkness and despair. And this is why the Bible often refers to God as being like the sun. Okay, so just as the sun is, is necessary for human life and vitality, which I think it's coming out this next week. I saw some 60-some degree days coming up. I'm like, it is Easter. Praise the Lord. But, but just as the sun is necessary for human life and vitality, God is the source of life. And everything that's good in the world, every single thing that's good in the world, it comes from him. It's a gift from him. And, and when we're cut off from him, it's like being cut off from life itself. And this is why hell is so terrible. It's a place where God is absent. At the cross, it was as if Jesus was being cut off from the sun. He was being thrown out of the orbit around the sun. He was being cut off from light and all goodness. He was experiencing hell. He was experiencing the end result of what happens to us if we choose to orbit our lives around anything other than God. In Tim Keller's book, again, he he talks about a guy named Ernest Shackleton. Good guy, great name. Amazing name. He was a British explorer in the early 1900s, and and he explored Antarctica. I don't know what would possess you to do that, but but that's his story. In in 1914, he took a crew to Antarctica with the plan to or to walk across the entire land and, and and to cross the South Pole while doing so. And they had to abandon their plan though because their ship got crushed by the ice. Okay, so over the following months, they fought to survive and to get home and. And one of his biographers says that uh, of all the difficulties, which included starvation and frigid temperatures, the, you know, the worst thing was the darkness. Okay, so if you get near the South Pole, in that area, the sun goes down in mid-May, and it doesn't come back up until late, or until late July. Okay, there's no sun for more than two months. And according to biographers of these uh, South Pole explorers, there is no desolation more complete than the polar nights. 
There's no sun for weeks on end, and it drives some people mad. It drives people crazy. You can't see forward. You can't see behind you. You have no sense of direction, and you can't even see yourself. It's as if you're losing your very own identity. You are utterly isolated. And this is the kind of darkness that, or that we face when we choose to orbit around anything other than the one true God, who's the source of light and the source of every good thing. When we choose to center our life around things in this world, we are in spiritual darkness. We are, are hopelessly disoriented, even if we don't realize it. And we are subject to eternal uh, disintegration. Like That's what hell is, eternal disintegration. And the end result is death and despair. But Jesus, the, the perfect and matchless Son of God, he is the royal one. He's the one who spoke the stars into existence. He spun this world into existence. He took on this separation. He took on this darkness. He, he took it on. But his separation, it was not without purpose, though. It's not like he's just doing it for fun, right? His, his suffering would lead to victory over that ancient serpent. It says this in verse 37 and 38. It says, And Jesus, and Jesus uttered a loud cry, and breathe his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Okay, when Jesus died, the curtain of the temple was ripped into two. Okay, and this was not some flimsy living room curtain, right? Like this was a thick, heavy curtain that guarded the most inner place of the temple that it was referred to as the Holy of Holies. And this was the place where the presence of God was said to dwell. And the only person who could enter was the high priest on the Day of Atonement could enter once a year uh, to offer a sacrifice for himself and for the people. And the curtain was a symbol of our separation from the presence of God. It was a reminder to the people that, that Satan, or Satan was victorious in Genesis 3 and he got us kicked out of the garden. As God is the source of life, the curtain was a reminder that, or that we're cut off from him and we're spiritually dead. In Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. That curtain was a reminder of that. God is so holy and so pure that he can't stand to be in communion with darkness and sin. He, his holiness has to judge it. His purity has to separate from it. His justice has to deal with it. And the curtain, it, it kept us away from his unapproachable holiness, purity, and justice. But when Jesus died, when he breathe his last, that curtain was torn. His death meant that God was becoming approachable again. Our sin was being dealt with. His separation was somehow putting us back together. It was reversing our disintegration. His willingness to be separated from God was giving us access to God. Jesus' separation secured our restoration. Come on, somebody, we're about to have church in here. Come on, his separation secured our restoration. And this isn't even the climax of the sermon. I just got really fired up for a moment. They're just hold on. Back off, buddy. Back off. That's later. All right. So on the cross, Jesus, he, he bridges the cosmic gap between us and God. Okay, because Jesus took on judgment for our sin, we can be forgiven and declared innocent in God's sight. And because he took our place, we can, can take his place in communion with God. We can join the dance. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. We might look like Jesus. We might take on his holiness and his purity and his righteousness. Jesus took on darkness so we could step into light. He paid the price of sin so we wouldn't have to. The cross made our restoration possible. It didn't just do that, though. There's more. I told you guys, it's a loaded text. In Mark 1.1, 1, 1, he told us that Jesus is both the Messiah and the Son of God. He wasn't just another man. He was God's very own son. And despite Jesus' extraordinary miracles and authority, up until this point, no one connected the dots that he truly was the Son of God. No human being had. The demons had seen it. God had said it. But up to this point, no human being had said it. In Mark 15, 37 to 39, it says this. It says, And Jesus uttered a cry, or a loud cry, and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Okay, so here we see the first human confession of Jesus' divinity. And this centurion, he was not a Jew. He brutally killed countless people. He was a terrible person. He, he was far from God. And despite that, he was the first person to confess that Jesus was the son of God. Right? He was the first person to finally get it. And this would have been scandalous for him. In Rome, there was only one son of God. And, 
In Roman coins from the time, they had engravings of Caesar Augustus, who was the Roman emperor for the first half of Jesus' life. And on the coin, there was a caption that said, Divi Filius. And that means son of God. Okay, so in the Roman world, the emperor was the son of God. The emperor was the divine one. The emperor was the one who bridged the gap between the gods and man. And the centurion, the one who wrote, or the one who works for Caesar, he's saying that Caesar is not the son of God. Jesus is. Jesus of Nazareth is the son of God. Something about his death had proved that to the centurion. Jesus' separation proved his divinity. It didn't just secure our restoration. It, it, it proved that he is the son of God. Somehow his death softened that hard heart. Jesus' death somehow opened that centurion's spiritually blind eyes. As the king of the Jews allowed himself to be crucified and to be crushed, the centurion's heart was crushed with love. Something about Jesus' death turned the allegiance of the soldier's heart from Caesar to him. Caesar was nothing compared to this Jesus of Nazareth. The cross proved the divinity of Jesus. The cross did not only secure our restoration, though. It didn't only secure or prove his divinity, he actually did something else as well. It, it also shows us how Eve, or how Eve's offspring crushed the head of the serpent. It says this in Colossians 2. It says he, referring to Jesus, canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, referring to the devil and his demons. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Okay, so when Jesus died, he disarmed the devil and his demons. He shamed them publicly. He, he proved them wrong and finally crushed their heads. Jesus' separation defeated the enemy. As Jesus was crushed, the serpent's head was crushed. By dying, Jesus absorbed all of our sin and death on himself. He took on hell so we wouldn't have to. He disarmed Satan. He, he took away his tactics. He proved Satan's original lie wrong. Okay, so Satan's original lie was, was that God was holding out on Adam and Eve. Essentially, he told them that God doesn't love them, and God was keeping something from them by, or by not allowing them to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But by coming to die for humans, Jesus proved that God does not hold out on us. It's quite the contrary. He is willing to give it all for us. Another tactic of the enemy is to tell us that our sin makes it so God could never love us or forgive us. His tactic is to pummel us with shame, to make us feel like God could never want to have a relationship with us. He entices, get this, he's pretty smart. He entices us to sin. He says, look how attractive this is. Do this thing. And then when we do, he's like, how dare you do that? God could never love you. How could you do that? God wants nothing to do with you. But by dying on the cross... Jesus proved that there is no condemnation for those who trust in Christ Jesus. Our sins have been paid in full. And Romans 8 tells us that Satan, he cannot even bring an accusation against God's chosen people. It's all been paid for. The cross disarmed the devil's hold on humans and on the world. And through it, Jesus nailed every accusation that the devil has lodged against us and God. He took it all and he nailed it on that cross. He silenced the devil's lies. Jesus' tender death, it, it, it defeated this ancient enemy. And the first sign of this was the melting of that centurion's heart. Come on, a hardened man who had brutally killed so many people, his heart was melted in the presence of the Son of God dying for him. Satan's hold was being defeated. And this centurion's confession, it's a model for us on how we can be saved. It shows us how we can have the same light penetrate our darkness. It shows us how our hearts can be softened. It, it, it shows us how Jesus can take on our sin and give us forgiveness. In Romans 10, Paul says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not maybe, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified or made right with God or, or restored, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. If we want to receive the restoration that Jesus' separation secured, we must see and trust that Jesus is the Son of God. And we must confess and believe, again, that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, to be saved simply, all we got to do is trust in what Jesus did on Calvary. We got to trust in that. 
And this is not just like a mental assent to like, okay, I believe that, that Jesus died and that he's God. And I think that sounds good to me. I, I want to get into heaven, so give me that ticket to heaven. I like that. Sounds nice. Cool. No, if we, if we truly believe in our hearts that Jesus is the son of God, it will change the way we live. It will change our allegiance from Caesar to Jesus. It will change the center of our life from the things of this world to him. Jesus will become king in our hearts. He will become our supreme desire and affection. And we're going to want to obey him, right? It's not like twisting your arm like, obey God. No, you want to obey him. If he would give his life for you, how could you not obey him? He's proven that he's good. He's not holding out on you. Stop trying to eat of that tree, right? It ain't going to be good. He knows what he's doing, right? When you see him on that cross for you, you want to obey him. He's the desire of your heart. You know he has good things for you. The fact that the king of the universe would die for us, it drives us to awe and wonder and devotion. So it's not just simply mental assent. It's heart belief. He is the son of God. He is my Lord. I believe in you. You're my king. As we see Jesus dying for us and we realize that he is the son of God, it will annihilate all the competing gods in our life. Okay, the main idea this morning is this. The Son of God was forsaken so we could be forgiven. The Son of God was forsaken so we could be forgiven. At the beginning of the sermon, I I shared about that fateful night in Minneapolis. It's one of the worst days of my life. It it wasn't that bad. But as Emma and I, we settled into that apartment. We were met by an alien invader that, that just wanted to ruin our married bliss. But the thing I failed to share is that Emma and I were not alone that night. All right, so my parents, they helped us move in. Her parents helped as well. But then my parents had had stayed the night. They blew up an air mattress, which is why we were on the floor in the living room talking. And we were talking about something. And and when I noticed that crawly thing by Emily, my dad wasted no time. First, he flexed his muscles. He's like, mwah. (laughs) And then he sprang into action. He doesn't know what it is. He grabs with his bare hands and squeezes it, crushes it. (laughs) <laughs> and blue guts came out of it. It was something. And when we flicked the light on, we realized that it was a cockroach. <laughs> and I tell you, we're like, okay, good. It's, it's taken care of. We're good now. <laughs> Just a few moments later, another one comes scurrying through. And what does he do? He grabs with the other hand. Crunch. <laughs> uh, being a good, loving father, he was able to sacrifice for our sakes. I think he kind of enjoyed it, though, which is weird. But, uh, it, but anyways. <laughs> He stood in the way of this invader so we wouldn't have to. He knew I'm a wimp. He's like, my son has no chance against this cockroach. I'm taking care of it. In a way, though, I know this is funny, but in a way, he he modeled what Jesus does for us on the cross. Okay, so sadly, my dad, he he couldn't stay in the living room every night, although I would have welcomed that at this point. Like, just stay there and fend off cockroaches all night for the rest of your life. No, but uh, so he had to go home. And, and oftentimes we would find cockroaches, like I'm telling you, we'd come in at night, be cockroaches on the wall, like, oh, cool, hello, and then run away and hide. But, uh, you know, so this would continue to happen. There was actually one time when a cockroach got in our bed. That's next level, okay? When you feel it scurrying, you're like, what is that in the morning? It scurries back up, what is that? And then you're like, oh, my gosh. So, but, but sadly, my dad, he couldn't be there to, or to fend all these off. But, but the thing is, what's beautiful about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is it was final. As he died in John's gospel, he declared that it was finished. The price of sin was dealt with and all we gotta do is trust in what he's done. And Jesus, here's the thing, he did not just die for past sin. So so here's the reality, in this life, we will face other cockroaches, so to speak. We're gonna face sin, we're gonna struggle, we're gonna, you know, face sin's effects. We we saw that this week, right? Not uh, necessarily, you know, personally, but in Tennessee, we saw what happened there. We saw uh, the tornadoes that, that came through our state. Like, we're going to continue to face things. We're going to face our own sin, our own struggles. We're going to mess up. We're going to totally blow it, guys, over and over again. But the beautiful thing is Jesus' sacrifice, it covers that too. He's always waiting to crush the cockroach with the full force of his Calvary love. He's waiting to crush it. He's already done it. He doesn't need to do it again, but, but he, he's waiting to remind us of that. If you're a follower of Jesus, you need to get that because Satan so lies to you. It says in 1 Peter 5, 8, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour and he lies to you all the time. 
Jesus did not just die for your past sins. He died for what you're currently struggling with. He died for what you're going to struggle with. He died for all of you, every part of you, the part before you, you put your trust in him, like the part of you in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s. He, he, he died for all of you. He saw your whole life. He saw everything you would ever do, and he said, I want that one. He paid it all on that cross. His blood is enough. The blood of Jesus is strong. Do you truly get that this morning? Like, do you really get what Jesus did for you at Golgotha? He knew everything you would ever do, and he still died for you. While you were still a sinner, he died for you. He didn't die for the perfect version of you, the, the version of you that gets up early, reads your Bible, doesn't sin that day. You probably did, but you thought you didn't sin that day. He died for all of you. He died for you even when you don't really desire him that much. And the only thing that's stopping you from receiving this gift is your ability to believe in the sheer goodness of God. He is good. He's perfect. He's not fickle like us. He doesn't hold stuff against us. He doesn't harbor revenge. He's different. The only thing stopping you from receiving it is knowing that God is full of grace. He's really that good. All you gotta do is call on his name, the name of Jesus, the son of God, the true Divi Phileas. Call on him. See him bleeding for you and put your trust in that. And as you do day after day, you continue to look at that tree and continue to put your trust in him. It does something to you. It changes you. Your hard heart softens. You become more tender. It transforms you into someone who wants to obey him. As you continue to know your junk and to know his love, it messes you up. And just like the centurion, your heart will melt and you'll want to orbit around him. Tim Keller again, he says, if you see Jesus losing the infinite love of his father out of his infinite love for you, it will melt your hardness no matter who you are. It will open your eyes and shatter your darkness and you will at long last be able to turn from these other things that are dominating your life addicting you and drawing you away from God. Jesus Christ's darkness can dispel and destroy your own so that in the place of hardness and darkness and death, we can have tenderness and light and life. Today, the invitation is simple. Look at Jesus on that tree. See him dying for you and believe in what it means. His blood means that that you can be forgiven if you simply receive it. Darkness and judgment do not have to have the final word. And the door to the Garden of Eden has been reopened. And you can now orbit around God again. You can walk with him. There is no shame if the blood of Jesus has washed you clean. And no matter what you've done or will do, forgiveness and grace is available to you. John 1, 16, I, I gotta read this. It says, for from his fullness, from the fullness of Jesus, we have all received grace upon grace, grace on top of grace. That's for you. That's for you all who call on his name, grace on top of grace, lavished on you, just thrown on you, dunked on you, just dumped on you, grace on top of grace. No matter how bad of a day you had, no matter what you did, grace on top of grace, that's available for you. If we can truly understand what Jesus did on the cross, it can change everything. The cross means that, that, that simple people like us, we have access to God no matter what we've done or what kind of day or week we've had. The cross means that, that Jesus is the true son of God. He is Eve's offspring who crushed the devil's head. Death and evil, it will not have the final word. The cross, it shows us that, that no matter how far you fall, you can be forgiven again and again and again. If we can truly grasp this grace, we'll be able to surrender to him and give him our whole hearts and follow him no matter what. All right, let's stand all across this room. I want to pray for grace to wash over this room this morning. Just like, just like open heaven, grace on top of grace. But before I do that, if you're here this morning, and if you're honest, you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, or you once did, but you've walked away from that, you haven't been living in relationship with him, I want to give you a chance to put your trust in Jesus today. 
you know, just like the centurion, he's standing there in public. He's like, truly this man was the son of God. That's essentially how you're saved. I believe in him. I trust him. That's all it is, right? There's no like magic formula. You just believe in Jesus as the son of God. And the way I want to do that is I'm just going to give you a chance to slip up your hand and just tell him that. Say, yeah, I believe you're the son of God. I, I trust you. Just a simple like, declaration. Just saying, yep, I believe in that. I trust you, Jesus. So if that's you, I'm going to count to three. And when I do, slip up your hand so I know who I'm praying for. Don't be afraid, right? right? No one here is going to judge you, right? The centurion, the man who, who served Caesar in front of his, his other guards, he said that in front of them, right? He wasn't afraid, right? Because Jesus was so compelling, he was willing to put his trust in Jesus in that moment. So if that's you, if you want to be saved or recommit your life to Christ, can you slip your hand on one, two, three, slip up all across this room, all across this room. I see that hand, I see that hand. Is there anyone else? Anyone else at all? Come on, today's your day. Salvation's near. Come on, is there anyone else? All right, all right. All right, go ahead and put your hands down. I'm gonna pray a simple prayer of trust and you just pray in your heart or yeah, pray in your heart. Just like, Jesus, I believe in you. And that's all you gotta do. Let's pray. Let's pray as a family. Jesus, right now, for those few people who, who wanna put their trust in you right now, God, God, with them, we declare truly you are the son of God. Surely you paid it all on the cross. You have paid our debt. And God, today we put our trust in that. We don't put our trust in ourselves. and in what we can do in our own righteousness, we put our trust in you, Jesus. And Jesus, I pray that as we do that, that there would be a supernatural transformation that happens. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, it says, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation, behold, the old is gone and the new has come. Right now, in Jesus' name, I declare new creations all across this room. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. All right, can we give God praise? Come on, people putting their trust in Jesus. Come on, all of heaven's rejoicing. All of heaven's rejoicing. Come on, come on. I just believe that, that God's doing something in this hour. Salvation, I believe so many people are, are going to receive salvation in this hour. I just believe that God's gonna sweep across this world, across America. I believe that, that God is doing something really supernatural in our day. I'm so excited to be a part of it. So if you put your trust in Jesus today, praise God and talk to someone about it afterwards. Um, okay, but also, if you're already a Christian, I wanna give you a chance to receive grace on top of grace. Maybe you came in here this morning and you're feeling shame. You're feeling, you're feeling kind of cut off from God. You're, you're feeling like he's kind of turned his back on you. Here's the thing, because God turned his back on Jesus, he'll, he'll never turn his back on you. Right? He already did it on Jesus. He already judged Jesus on your behalf. So, so God's never gonna turn his shoulder away from you. But, but for some reason, the devil has lied to you and made you believe that he has turned his shoulder from you. And this morning, I wanna pray for those that, that just need a download of grace. You just need love dumped on you this morning. So if that's you, can you step up your hands so I know who I'm praying for? You just need grace this morning. I see those hands. Anyone else? You just need grace. Like, like Lord, I just need grace on top of grace. All right, all right, let's pray as a family. Jesus, right now, for those that just need your grace, I pray that you just, just dump it on them, Lord. Grace on top of grace, grace beyond measure. Yes, Lord, show these people, show us how much you love us, Lord, and, and what you did for us. Help us to truly understand what you did on the cross. Yes, Jesus, we love you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. All right, so the prayer team is going to be up here. If you want prayer, I encourage you to come and receive prayer from these great people. And then also the altars are open during this last worship song. If you want to come to the altar and just get alone with God, I want to encourage you to do that. Take that step of faith. There's something special about the altar where God just meets with us. So I just want to invite you to do that. All right, let's go ahead and worship.